And we're reminded since uh, COVID hit and we've reopened, the back room is also part of the sanctuary. Um, the doors are wide open there. And so we need that space to seat everyone, uh, some distancing. And, but it's still part of the quiet zone. So it's just a reminder that as we come to worship, we need to prepare ourselves. And uh, there's a time for fellowship. We were certainly welcome and encourage it. And generally speaking, that comes after the service. Then we have plenty of time to chat and uh, inter inter uh, interact with each other. So keep that in mind, if you will. Now, you have some announcements in your bulletin. First one that didn't get mentioned, but is the Lottie Moon offering, which is being collected in that box, the wooden box there, in the back table. There's envelopes on top if you need them. Uh, you also have the uh, order for poinsettias. If you would like to order one, you need to get that to uh, Mindy uh, today. Now, also remember that uh, we have a meeting following the service this morning. A business meeting. I don't think it'll be long. But we'll give you a short break, but we'll try to meet immediately as, you know, as soon as possible when the service ends. Um, and this is what it's all about. A special church meeting of the First Baptist Church of Amsterdam, New York, will be held on sun Sunday, December 6, 2020, in the church building, immediately following the worship service for the purpose of adopting a, a proposed church budget for 2021 and conducting any other business that may usually come before the meeting. And that was issued by our church clerk, Linda Wagner. So keep that in mind after the service. We're going to have a word of prayer, and then our associate pastor, Sean, and his wife, I believe, are going to come and have the Advent presentation for this morning. So we pray. Lord, we thank you that your word declares that the Most High God rules in the kingdom of men, and he appoints over it whom he will. We are thankful, Lord, that your word constantly and consistently assures us that God reigns. He is in charge. You are, Lord. So we're thankful that we have a God who is that great, but also that good and merciful and gracious to forgive sin and provide redemption for us. We need you, Lord. We need you this morning. We ask that you to speak to our hearts and bless this service. May you be glorified throughout all it's said and done. For this end, we do pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The second Advent candle, purple, is the candle of preparation and symbolizes his light and preparation. Luke, chapter 3, verses 4 through 6. As is written in the book of the words of Isaiah, the prophet, the voice one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, making his path straight. Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill shall be brought low, and the crooked shall be made straight and rough ways shall be made smooth, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. This is the Gospel of the Lord. I believe it is John Baptist, too. John Baptist who is saying this. And then Psalms 25, verses 1 through 10. In you, Lord my God, I put my trust. I trust in you. I do not let me be put to shame nor let my enemies triumph over me. No one who hopes in you will ever be put to shame, but shame will come on those who are treacherous well caused. Show me your ways, Lord. Teach me your paths. Guide me in your truth and teach me, for you are God, my Savior, and my hope is in you all day long. Remember, Lord, your great mercy and love for they are from old. Do not remember the sins of my youth and my rebellious ways according to your love. Remember me for you, Lord, are good. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he instructs sinners in his ways. He guides the humble in what is right and teaches them his way. 
All the ways of the Lord are loving and faithful towards those who keep the demands of his covenant. This is the word of the Lord. Preparation means to get ready. Help us be ready to welcome you, O oh God. We'll begin our worship service this morning by singing hymn 175 of Hymn from the Nile.
and began experiencing symptoms of COVID. She was tested, she is positive. Uh, they will not be here for a few weeks because of that. As far as I know, John has yet to exhibit any symptoms as of this morning. He didn't tell me he had any symptoms. So I don't believe there's any danger to anyone in the congregation for having been near them. They always keep their masks on. But just a note of caution, we are in a heightened time dealing with this virus, so we may need to take additional precautions. Uh, if we feel like we need to wear masks, we need to wear masks. If we feel like we need to stay more distant, then we need to stay more distant. Everybody has to use some degree of personal responsibility here. That's all I'm saying. We're not going to make any changes, except we are going to expand seating over in the overflow room for uh, Christmas Eve at least, and, and maybe the Sunday before and the Sunday after Christmas, we're going to move some things around and have a lot more seats out there so we can spread a little more. Christmas Eve is going to be different. Our candle lighting is not going to be our traditional circle around because we can't keep our distances that way. We're going to stay in our pews just to give you some heads up on some of the things that are coming. So uh, those things I, I think are necessary. Also, uh, the Santarello family has a bunch of prayer requests. They're not here this morning. Melissa had to work and some other things going on there. But Melissa's oldest daughter, we don't know her, uh, she's married to a gentleman named Gates Klein, and Gates has a tumor in his brain, and he's having some dysfunction, so they're waiting on an MRI to have that done, uh, I believe next week or the week after, and they're going to see if the tumor has grown any. Apparently it's a known thing, but they think it may have grown now, so they're testing for that. His name is Gates Klein. The other part of the Santarellos family, Henry's brother Tim, who lives right down the street, uh, they live in one apartment building, and the other apartment is occupied by the mom, Elizabeth. Some of us may know Elizabeth because she's come up to camp this summer that, uh, that uh, Nicole was working at the camp. Uh, he has developed COVID. Tim has developed COVID. Elizabeth has a lot of serious health issues, so we need to be in prayer for the whole Santarella family there. And, of course, as I said, John and Mary for that. And that is all I have in the way of prayer requests. I haven't been given anything else. I want to pray for our elderly because they're going through some really hard times. I work at a nursing home that you guys know at the beginning of the year got hit with COVID hard. And the change in these people is just bad. They're not even getting the care because a lot of people quit in the bedroom. So just pray for the people who take care of them, who have patience with them, and just for them. We're thankful that you've been safeguarded throughout all this. Week. Yes, thank God. Yes. It's, been a, it's been a tough time, we know that. All right, let's go to prayer. Oh, thank you, Clark. Uh, just for Byron, continue prayer. She's still carrying this awful dizziness, and uh, she's sounding less than my doctor is saying. She sounds a little bit more down. That, that's unusual because she's usually upbeat. At least she is when I speak with her just every couple of weeks. Okay, let's go to prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning. Thankful, Father, first of all, that you are our God. That no matter what, no matter when, no matter where, you are our God. That never changes. Father, we thank you for your steadfastness, your loving kindness, your tender mercies. All these things that never fail, they continue to be with us. Thank you for pouring them out day by day. We thank you for your protection generally for our people. We thank you for taking care of us as you have. We ask you to be with those folks who have uh, recently encountered this virus. I pray that you be with Miriam and get her past this. We pray that even by now she's starting to turn the corner and come back. And pray that you protect John from uh, acquiring the, the disease and uh, protect the entire congregation because we may get exposed anywhere, the gas station, the supermarket, walking on the street. These exposures are entirely possible. Some of us have jobs that put us in more uh, dangerous range, I guess we should say, for some people. I pray that you be with the caretakers and many folks who work in healthcare facilities, that be with them, help them to remain empathetic and yet be protective of themselves and protective of their families, and that's a delicate balance to we pray that you watch over them. Be with the elderly that are shut into the nursing homes. We know that there have been incredible problems with uh, 
the mental state of folks who have been shut in. They've deteriorated at a highly accelerated rate, more, more than they would normally be expected to do so. So Father, I ask your grace in those places uh, and keep all of all our medical workers, whether it be the uh, EMTs that are on the front lines and other emergency service personnel, police and fire, uh, be with them and offer them a level of protection that is only divine, is beyond any personal protection measure that we can take. Father, I, I do pray that you will continue to watch over this congregation. I pray that this church can keep its doors open fully. I pray that as this holiday season, this Christmas Advent season that we have, it comes upon us. I pray that people are open and hungry for the fellowship that can only be found, for the light that can only be found within a Christian church. And I pray that you will bring people in and allow us to minister to them uh, so that we can give them your hope, your peace, your grace, your love. And Father, now as we turn into our worship here, deeper into our worship, I pray that you be with us. As we do what we do each week, we return to you a portion of what you have given us. We thank you for the many blessings you pour out, and you do. Your blessings are amazing. So, Father, as we give back the peace of that, we pray that you will bless us by our giving and use those gifts wisely here. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>
enlighten us, truly open our hearts so we hear what you have to tell us. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'm going to, going to give you this morning a little bit of top-loaded application. And I'm going to toss a lot of scripture into this. You may or may not get all the references. That's fine. Most of them are very familiar to you. But when I load the application on the top, it's because there's something I want you to carry through in your mind all the way through this. As we work through the text, I want this other piece of scripture to hang in the background. 1 Peter 5, 6, and 7, one of my favorite passages. Most of us know half of it. Most of us know the second half of this very well. Don't forget about the first half. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him, because he cares for you. Park that back there and hang on to that for a while. Looking back at Isaiah 9, Isaiah 9, as is Isaiah, is a prophetic book. It talks about mostly what's going to come in the past and has, or in the future. It has pieces of history well within it. It also speaks very often in what's called the prophetic past. Much of this passage is written in the past tense. And yet, as we understand it, it hadn't happened yet when Isaiah wrote it. We need something of a short history lesson here to fully understand what's going on in this capacity. And Isaiah would have been writing sometime between 740 and 700 BC. He may have continued to write as long as to his death, which was around 680 BC or thereabouts. But this was probably closer to 640 BC. He was speaking in this case to the nation of Israel, the northern kingdom, not the southern kingdom specifically. He references Zebulon and Naphtali. This was part of that northern kingdom. This would be the kingdom that in 721 BC was overrun by the Assyrians and essentially wiped out. The ten lost tribes, as are often talked about, these would have been the ten northern kingdoms, or the ten tribes of the northern kingdom. Uh, he uses a couple terms that are interesting because they only appear in his writings in, within scripture. They appear other, in other writings that are of that period. Zebulon, or I'm sorry, the, uh, the way of the sea and Galilee of the Gentiles. They're not normally used in scripture. They're used outside of that. And they're all talking about that northern area. The nation of Galilee was quite well dominated by the Gentiles at one point in time in, in this general time frame. It was maybe you would even say contaminated by the Gentiles, but if we think forward, where did Jesus begin his ministry? Galilee. Okay, so keep that maybe in the back of your mind as well. Uh, the way of the sea is a comment on the major route that flowed through that northern country from inland out to the Mediterranean Sea. It was a military route, it was a trade route. So Isaiah references these things, so there's no doubt about what he's talking about. And we find throughout this, we can piece together things from other parts of Scripture that there is no doubt at all what we're speaking of in this prophecy. What we have here is a, it's a practical matter, is a boom and boom message that has just been delivered to the nation of Israel. The whole of Isaiah chapter 8 makes it pretty sad looking for this nation because they had fallen greatly into sin. And they would not, they did not, they continually objected to the prophets and the messages that they, they had and would not, did not repent. So that's the problem there. But here we have hope projected. So the problem, and it's a big problem, and it's not just from that time, the problem we've already talked about in a previous message, it began in the garden when Satan tempted Eve. And then it just snowballed from there. We had this problem of sin entering in the world. Now, we follow the path of sin. We go from Adam and Eve. We go to Cain and Abel. We go to Noah. And we go on down through the history of the nation of Egypt, or the nation of Israel, through its release from Egypt, after its bondage there, the building of the nation, the dividing of the kingdom. And here we are. And they still have the same problem, the problem being sin. We have idolatry, adultery, immorality, 
murder, pride, hatred, strife, jealousy, gossip, all the sins that we deal with yet today were present then. And God has decided he's going to judge this northern kingdom and he's going to do it by way of this nation of Assyria. It was a time, as the text here tells us, of deep darkness. See, darkness was voluntary because the word of the prophet was given continually and throughout all the words of the prophecies, they continued to just go on about their business and they stoned the prophets, they chased the prophets out, they killed the prophets. They just continued on their own way, liking their sin more than the solution to their sin. All this, as we know, was provoked by Satan. Satan would be the continuing antagonist of God's people throughout all time until everything is resolved in the end of time. And actually, this text gives us a little bit of a hint of that. As a practical matter, we can see some of this prophecy already completed. Much of it lies yet to be completed. But this doom and gloom, let's just face it, it doesn't look good. So the problem with sin is there. And the darkness is incredibly deep, and there's only one fix for it. And that's the plan of salvation. There's a, a great song, I referenced it before. Uh, it, it's kind of a, I think it's a product of the 60s, the 1960s. It was called In the Image of God. And the line in, in the chorus of it goes, But from eternity God had in mind the cross of Calvary, the, the lost to find. See, none of this happened as a surprise to God. God is omniscient. He knew in eternity past how this was going to play out, and he planned a solution to the problem. And this solution is one and one thing only, and that's Jesus Christ, his son. He sets in, plan, in, in place a plan to keep redemption alive. Every place we look in the history through the Old Testament, there's a remnant remaining. You know, we look at it when we, we start really looking at the flood when he kept Noah, and then we keep going through there, and even at the time of the exile, a godly remnant remained. And we can assume that when Assyria conquered the northern kingdom, there was a godly remnant even within them that went out and was dispersed. So there was still some message of truth that went out with them as they were dispersed, dragged away very painfully usually, under the, what we have from the history there. And within that plan, writing hundreds of years before the birth of Christ, remember he started writing in 740 BC roughly, 740 years before the time of Christ, roughly. So think about the way this plays out when it's written that far forward and what we have. You see, he made a provision. He made a provision for Jesus to come to earth, be born of a virgin, live a sinless life, and then die as a final sacrifice for our sins. Isaiah doesn't really deal with that here. We see some of that like in Isaiah 53, which we'll probably get to around uh, resurrection time. And, but we're not going to address that this morning. But Isaiah lays out what's going to happen in the future here. Okay? And there's no doubt, following all of Scripture, what, the, what does happen here. See, the light in the darkness that is displayed here in Isaiah 9, 2, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them light is shown. There's no doubt where that ends up. We'll get to that in just a second. But he goes on to say how the victory was going to be complete, absolutely complete, and it references as in the day of Midian. Uh, that's a reference to Joshua conquering Midian. The battle would end with such an amazing victory. Bondage would be completely broken. All the instruments of and the evidence of war was going to be destroyed. And we may see some of that, some of what's here is, is future uh, maybe some of that was fulfilled at the end of the exile, maybe not. It's not fully going to be realized until the end of time when Christ comes and makes all things new. And, but we have to deal with the identity of Jesus here. The 
the identity of Jesus can be in no doubt when we look into the New Testament and we look into Luke chapter 2, 32. This is where we see what I think is one of the greatest soliloquies in all of Scripture. It's a very short one. It is this godly man in the temple named Simeon. And he takes the child, and I'm only going to give you a little snippet of it because uh, I'm not sure it may be used in a sermon someplace later. But he holds the child and he says, A light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory for your people Israel. And he recognized this child as the light that was going to come into the world. The oppression is gone and a new reign will appear, the reign of Jesus Christ. And that reign is explained for us here in, in verses 6 and 7. A child is born, a son is given, he will sit on the throne of David, his father David. And actually, he's there now in a sense because Jesus is where now? Sitting at the right hand of the father. Now we understand this, that the full conquest is not complete. We understand that it's a process going on here. That the entirety is being put under his feet. Hebrews 2 verse 8 tells us that he is putting everything, God is putting everything, in subjection under his feet. Now in putting everything into subjection to him, he left nothing outside his control. At present, we do not see everything as subject in subjection to him. So we don't have it completely displayed for us. But Isaiah is seeing it as though it's going to be completed. So we have to have the faith that Isaiah has this all right, Isaiah being the prophet of the Most High God. When this subjection is complete, we're going to see a handful of things that are laid out for us here. The government will be upon his shoulders. He will be the wonderful counselor, the mighty God. This speaks to this perfect reign of the perfect son of the almighty God. That's something we're looking forward to. He will be known as the everlasting father. And this is not necessarily the way they would have seen it then. They probably wouldn't have understood that as we do today as far as Father, Son, Holy Ghost. They didn't have that in, developed in their theology yet. It hadn't all been revealed to them. But now we look back and we see it very clearly. You see Father and Son. But there's a Hebrew idiom there that would have seen that as a statement not of divinity so much, but a statement of a long-reigning and benevolent ruler. So that's what they saw was coming there. That's what they would have heard when Isaiah spoke or read that. Now, that brings the question of how much have we seen looking back at history? Well, we can see now the development of the theology of the Trinity. Matter of fact, that was part of Sunday school class this morning. Here's a commercial. If you don't come to Sunday school, you're missing a great big piece of church history. And this morning in the general class, we were talking about a watershed moment in the history of the church. It was called the Council of Nicaea. And it was a significant event in the history of the church and the development of the theology that we have today and our understanding of who Jesus is and the position he holds. So as we look back in this period of time, the Israelites listening or reading this message from Isaiah can almost be excused for not getting it all. There was no excuse for not getting that they were in trouble. And not there was no excuse for not understanding that there was a deliverance available to them in the, in the form of repentance and returning to their God. But they can be almost understood as, you know what, Are we, we're not sure all of this is happening quite the way Isaiah is seeing this. But they had the right and they had the obligation to believe, as he said. Okay, we're without excuse entirely. We have a complete revelation of the Word of God. We have every word written that He wants us to have. And that's critical. To understand that everything we need to know is written here. And we're going to understand it on different levels. I think I said last week in a church like this, we have everything from preschools to PhDs. You know, so everybody can get something out of this. And there's enough for, at every level to understand the plan of salvation that God has, has presented for us. And so 
We're without excuse because the light has dawned. In the book of John, we have a lot of verses that relate to that specifically. John 1, 4, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. 1, 9 says, the true light which gives light to everyone was coming into this world. See, he ushered in the kingdom of God. We understand that when we read Mark 1, 14 and 15. It talks about how in the period of time after uh, John the Baptist had been arrested, Jesus comes into the scene and says the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. The gospel, the good news that this light has in fact dawned. And now the kingdom continues to expand as the people come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. We have a very interesting situation that we have Christianity growing in spite of major persecution. As we look around the world, we see Christians in Africa and in Asia being persecuted to death. They lose their property, they lose their homes, they lose their family. They're assaulted. And this is part of the growth of the church. Look at China. Probably the biggest, fastest growing church in the world is in communist China. How do, you, how do you explain that? Except this is the light that is coming into the lives of these people. This is explained for us. If I can get my computer to work. No, it's not frozen. It's just mad at me. <laughs> Sometimes you've got to do things different. Uh, hope it stays. Uh, what we have is this kingdom that continues to expand as people come to a saving knowledge of Christ. And the kingdom will continue to expand. Revelation 11:15 tells us this. The seventh angel blew his trumpet and there were loud voices in heaven saying, and everybody knows this line, the kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. And he shall reign forever and ever. There is a time coming when everything will be put to, to subjection under his feet. And God will reign. He's called the Prince of Peace. We don't see peace in the world today. We're going to see it then. This is something that's yet to be completed when he comes in his glorious form. But now we get to this piece that's really application. How are we going to deal with this today? You know, as the people of Israel were, we are in a dark time, a very dark time. We have politics and pandemic. We have despair and depression. Everybody knows the term sad, seasonal affective disorder, right? What's the solution to seasonal affective disorder? Light. See a parallel here? Okay. We have family strife, we have financial strife, we have problems on top of problems on top of problems, but there's hope because the gospel is here. The light has dawned. Things are coming into subjection under his feet, slowly but surely when it happens, when he returns, it will be completed. And here we go back to that couple of verses I put out earlier. We need to humble ourselves. This may mean the initial humbling that comes with confession and repentance. This is where we finally come to the end of ourselves, recognize that we can't save ourselves. And anything and everything we do is inadequate in an eternal perspective. This is where we come to the point of saying, Lord, I'm a sinner. Forgive my sins. I trust the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. That may be the point some haven't gotten to yet. That's the initial stage of humility. It may mean repeated confession and repentance. Usually that will sound something like, here I am again, Lord. <sighs> Forgive me, get me back on track, get me started over. And it may mean the continual humiliation of where we often are in this world. And this is really at every level of age, if you think about it, from teens to, you know, the, 
the uh, older folks like myself and those older, it may mean the humiliation of saying, I can't handle this alone. Whatever this may be. See, when we humble ourselves and are honest with him in this, then he can lift us up. And then we can cast all our anxieties on him. And note there, it says, how many anxieties? Uh-huh. All of them. It doesn't mean some of them. It doesn't mean only the big ones. It says all. As a matter of fact, I, I believe that when we hang on to some of our anxieties, I think that's a form of idolatry. Because we're saying, you're not big enough for this, God. i got to do this for myself. See, see how that works? We're making ourselves into a type of God. So here we are, you know, a couple of weeks away from the celebration of the birth of Jesus. We call it Christmas, call it Advent, whatever it may be. And as we approach this time, we realize we can be released from the bondage. All that was necessary for the people of Israel was being spoken to in this passage for them to humble themselves before the hand of the Almighty God. And he would have exalted them, but they didn't. And, and, and that's a scary thought as we look at history. We can read, you can go back and read the histories, you can read the other prophets on what happened to Israel. It wasn't pretty. And as we see the direction of society is going today, it's not that different than what was happening in Israel. Because even in those days, the prophets were complicit in the idolatry. And today, the churches are complicit in the idolatry. The churches have changed the doctrine. Doctrine has been fought for for hundreds of years, 2,000 years, as a matter of fact. To get it right, we go back to the Word of God. And we go back to being the children of God, not the children of Satan. We have to approach this celebration understanding that Jesus came to release us from the bondage of sin, the penalty of sin, yes, but the bondage of sin as well. The gospel applies not just to the unbeliever, the gospel applies to the believer. I want to be guided by the words of the hymn that goes back to uh, 1641, and knowing how I am with emotion and hard-hitting songs, I've made a wise decision, and I've asked my wife to come up and read this for us. As everyone knows, I never cry. <laughs> <laughs> Break forth, O oh beauteous heavenly light, and usher in the morning, O oh shepherds, shrink not with a fright. But hear the angel's warning. This child, now weak in infancy, our confidence and joy shall be. The power of Satan breaking, our peace eternal may be. The power of Satan breaking, you get that? He does not have to rule our lives. He was reigning in Israel, much to their detriment, much to their loss. Don't let him reign in our lives. As we celebrate Christ, his birth, his death, his resurrection, let's keep that in mind. And now we're going to come to a time in a minute or so, Pastor Sean's going to come up and supervise the uh, administration of the, the elements of communion. But we're coming into this time of communion, and as I pray, as I pray, and he's going to give you some warning also, as I pray, this is a great time to humble ourselves before the mighty hand. God. Let's pray. Father, as we look at this, we are in awe of the words of your prophet. We are absolutely staggered that 700 years before your son came, he gave this accurate depiction of all that was going to transpire. And now we look back on it and we marvel if we're alert. Lord, humble us. Make us very much aware of where we fail. And as we go into this time where we celebrate your death and resurrection, let us be honest before you. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. As we go
going to this time, let's remember this is a uh, church ordinance, and let us be mindful of those who are not here with us, or wish who could be with, here with us as well. As is, it is written in 1 Corinthians 11, the Apostle Paul had written, For I have received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given him thanks, he had broken it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This is a cup, a new covenant in my blood. Do this also. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And it goes on and says, the warning. Whoever therefore eats the bread and drinks the cup, the Lord is in an unworthy ma manner will be guilty of concerning the body of the blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself, then as so of eat the bread and drink of the cup. Whoever who drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks in judgment of himself. Gentlemen, would you? Distribute the elements, please. Eric, would you 
would you please pray over the juice from the fruit of the vine? Father, we do just pray and thank you that before time you had a plan. You knew what was needed that we could then fellowship with you. And Lord, we just ask that your blessing be upon this cup that as we participate take of it, Lord, that we would remember what your son did that we would then be
believe in a few minutes, guys. Go ahead. Like, they didn't impact, they made you, yes, that you felt was important. Got it. 